this opportunity we have just to uh, be together with you. Thank you for your your love, your support, your uh, giving to us, and your supplying of our needs. And thank you for the time we've had this uh, last couple of days with the family, celebrating Thanksgiving, being thankful for all you have given, and again for the love, for the presence around loved ones, and a lot of times of sharing and talking and just catching up on on reflections on all the things you have done in our lives and are continuing to do and yet will do. So we thank you for all your provision and all your love and all your peace that you give. Thank you for allowing us to uh, to be still and know that you are God, knowing that at those moments that we see your hand and your presence in our lives. Calm my heart, soul, spirit, and us all to just take the moments in this time of the year to take a deep breath and see you and your hand and how you have continued to work in our lives. So we thank you now for this time of study. We look now to uh, the 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 how and the whys behind uh, how grateful and thankful we are to know you as our God, as our Father, not just as ones believing in Christ and being covered by your blood, but specific to us and how you've made things uh, more aware to us of more details of your character, more details of your word, more details of what's out ahead and the appreciation that all the more, uh, not just anyone should have that's in Christ, but particularly for those that you're growing and maturing in a way in which you're growing our hearts, minds, and spirits to understand and be an opportunity to be closer to you evermore. So we thank you for being our loving Father, our, our good shepherd, our pastor, our teacher, our counselor. For everything in this time, we ask that you be with us, and we ask all this in Jesus, Yeshua's name we pray, amen. All right, so today will be, like I say, a lesson that'll be, I'm just gonna say it's, it's called Thankful and Grateful. I'm gonna call it, I've never done one like this, I don't think. So I just basically went through some scriptures, and I wanted to cover some scriptures that talked about being thankful and grateful specifically, and then look at that from our standpoint and how we are to understand from how who we are as people, given who we are, and I think given what we're at. So I think this is important. We're going to look in some of the Old Testament and some of the New Testament. We're going to have a little bit more scriptures in the Old. So go to Psalm 68. Go to Psalm 68. <coughs> we'll start there, and I'll read these in order. So I, there's a couple of psalms here that I've picked out. And what I'm looking for is, you know, why should we be thankful? What do we, th what, why should we be grateful? And we already know why. I mean, we can say, okay, God loves us because, right, but I want the scriptures specific to those things that you can always hang your hat on and, and remind ourselves all the more as we see these days around us uh, in our country and how we celebrate. So Psalm 68, <coughs> verse 19. And he says, blessed be Adonai who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God our salvation. And he says, Selah. And that's the ending of the thought, with the last thought he has before Selah means ponder this, basically. The word bless is the word Baruch. And the word Baruch is the word that means to, it's hard to, uh, to say it in words that's more than one word, but the word blessing, it's almost like the imagery of a king uh, who knights somebody. So you, there's a little bit of a lunging downward with the sword over the shoulders of the knight. So when you use the word baruch or blessing, it means to, to kneel down and endow one with blessing. So God did that, did he not? He reached down from heaven and became man. He kind of knelt down. I've, I've used that analogy many times in my earlier understanding of God's love and sovereignty and how it's so big, a big deal. We say, we have free will. We're talking about earlier today. And I, I think it's, we say, What's, why is that a big deal? Because it's a big deal because now you're, because now you're putting the relationship on even playing field. And that's an insult to what God did. He knelt down and blessed us with great and many blessings. For if you don't see that image of that Baruch, that blessing means to kneel down and endow him a blessing. It speaks to his higher lofty plane of a sovereign God who knelt down out of compassion and empathy to give to us. And so people who don't see that and think it's a free will thing, they're looking at it more of an even exchange. There's no even exchange. They'll say that they see God's bigger than them. Well, then how come the choice is not bigger than you? It, it doesn't work that way. You can't make God bigger than you, but then make the choice to be with him the same as an exchange that you have every right to say yes or no. No, you do not. God is the one who kneels down and endows you with a blessing, whether he does or he doesn't. That's up to him. So when he says in chapter, again, 68, verse 19, blessed be, blessed be that Lord. So that word blessing is, again, kneeling down. He's blessed because that's what he is, who he is. He's blessed. He's Baruch. He's the one who gives all blessing. When, I say, when he's used, you ever see that phrasing, bless the Lord, O my soul, all that's in me, or bless be Adonai? It, it, it means that, again, of every blessing we have, 
that's been in, it's been endowed to us by a father, a God who's knelt down and given it to us. That's why all blessing belongs to him. In other words, all blessing, which in the New Testament, the word blessing is the word for happiness. So all of your joy or happiness, your, 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 your ways in which you would smile, think about things in life, is all because of a foundation of the God loves you grant. <laughs> you know, it's just an amazing concept to think about that word blessed. Blessed or the blessing. Again, and he says, who daily loads us with benefits. And so this... Oh, yeah. Ha yes. Todd said, does God love those who are destined for the valley of the hog's back? Well, here's the thing. So um, there's a, and that's a trick question, actually, um, because there's multiple loves of God, right? So God loves, in a general sense, all of his creation from the sense that he loves everything that he's made. So the answer is yes and no. So it, it's yes and no. It's a great, it's a great question, man. It's a great question, because the artist, regardless of what he makes, is still going to love all of his creation that he made. That's a fact. He loves, he says everything he made, uh, and it was good. He made everything. He made everything, and so it's all good. However, does that mean, he loved the anointed cherub that covered it till he, be, till he had iniquity found in him, and he was kicked out of heaven, right? So, so there's the initial love but if, if people say, well, that God, that changed. God hates Satan now. Well, then God changes that. I thought, I thought, God, I thought God never changed. Ooh. So you got to, right? So there's a creation that God makes that he loves, but then there's the approval love or the collaborative love that he gives only to those. There's two pieces of that collaboration love. One, he imputes the empowerment from which to collaborate, which redefines the second tier of love. So there's a love God gives to everything he creates, everything he makes. Everything he creates and makes, he has a general love for because he's the artist. He made it all. Everything, plants, birds, humans, in the same way. You understand what I'm saying now? When I say the word love, I mean in the same way he loves a plant, a tree, a bird, an animal of any kind. Anything he makes that's alive, he loves it all because he's the creator. Even things that are not alive, the mountains, right? They're not alive. <laughs> They're rock. He, he loves them all. He loves everything that he makes, the oceans, the sky, everything, everything he makes, he loves because he's the creator. He's not going to hate his own creation. That's, that's insanity. However, there's a second tier of love that he gives from an empowerment standpoint. Now, of that general creation that he loves, then he empowers some of that creation to be covered by a basically a promissory note that he's going to elect some to have a relationship with him and some to not. I, I don't know how he does that. He just does that. He says in Ephesians, according to his own good will and pleasure, who am I to say what that is? Who are you to say what that is? For us to try to figure that out is like saying, oh, that's why he made that tree, that height, that color, that. You don't know that, so stop lying. I don't know why that seed comes out and produces corn. I don't know how that works, okay? I don't know how, how uh, that particular that little, little, little tadpole goes into a frog. I don't, I don't know that. I don't know how that all works. I don't know how he, how he does that, but he does. He does. So... Why, he d why, why didn't it start off differently? Why do birds have eggs? We're not from eggs. Well, sperm and an egg, but we're, from a, we're, we're a fetus in a womb. But why is it that there's this egg that hatches for some species? Other species are born right out of the womb, like we are out of the womb, right? You know? What is that about? I, I don't know. I don't know. You know. So I don't know why those things are, but God does those things, right? So if someone tried to figure that out, it, it, it's just trying to figure out, well, that's, wh that's why God loves this one. I, I don't know that. I don't know, it just is. And God says it because he says he's the architect and the designer and Father knows best. I'm going to trust it. I'm going to believe it. And why would I not? There's nothing around me that, that would say that he got something wrong. People make fun of him and say, oh, God made the platypus to say that's what, that was God's joke on human because that's like a, you know, the beaver and the otter kind of mixed up together. I, I get it. It looks kind of weird. <laughs> so, but the whole thing is that, that when you look at going back to what you were saying, so God has a love for his creation. God has another love that he gives to all those that he's going to impute a special measure of, of grace and faith by giving them an empowerment. An empowerment to what? To see and know that he is God. To take them out of ignorance of just being in the creation and knowing who the creator is behind their creation. So there's creation love. Then there's a second tier love as creator. The creation knows he's the creator. But then there's a third kind of love that says now that you know that he's the creator and you're the creation, you actually also know 
that you want to do right by him and please him through your obedience. So those are your three tiers of love. So to make it simple, you could say it's creator love for his, for his artistry and his handiwork, whether it's making or creating something. There's the creator and creation love, where the creation, some of them are made aware of their creator, who forever is to be praised. And they're made aware of who he is and that they are made for a purpose by his hand. And then there's a, the third tier of love that that knowledge of that creator who made that creation then desires to please him by living a life of obedience. And that's the best way to say that. So does God love people in Jehoshaphat? In a creator sense, yes. And, and he, he, cre he created them. But in a collaborative sense as giving them some empowerment to know who he is? No. No. Because he didn't. They don't know who he is. That's why they're there. He said, why would he do that? The same reason why an artist would paint something on a canvas, a human, sinful, finite idiot who we call a savant or a genius, a Rembrandt, a Van Gogh, a Picasso, could make a painting and then destroy it and then make another one because they deem it not worthy of their handiwork. Hey, that's not my decision. How, how can I tell Van Gogh or Rembrandt or those guys, Da Vinci, oh, that's uh, Michelangelo. I think you're like that, that, that whole Sistine Chapel thing. You're going to put an angel over here and then reach the arm a little further, show more of the... No, I can't tell him how to do that. He's the artist. But if he deems it not worthy of his acceptance of what he calls his artwork, he can have every right to take the canvas and ruin it. Right? Doesn't he? Isn't that what artists do? They all the time. By the way, we were at an artist one time when we said, oh, the, you, he, he took a place where there was no doors. He was doing a live painting. And he took the place where there was no, no window and no stairwell, and he just painted it oh, right onto the painting. I'm like, you just changed it right in front of us. I'm like, how did you do that without like erasing stuff? He just kind of like, it was weird. So. Artists can do what they want to do. They can add, they can take away, they can, e they can eradicate everything. They have the right because they're the artist. You, we as the creation, the byproduct, have no right to tell the artist, you know, why did you make me like this? That's what Paul's talking about in Romans 9. You can't say he made me for noble use, you for common use. You have no right. You, you're speechless in that process. You, you don't have a right to talk about that. Your height, your weight, your hair color, your eye color, your nose, your ear shape, all that is destined by God. You had no say so in it. Yeah, that's right. Well, yeah, or the vessel of the potter would make us thou. And it's the same goes back to the issue of, yeah, blessed be the Lord. That's what he's saying. Who, again, in verse 19 of chapter 68 of, of Psalms, who daily loads us up. And that word loads us is the word amos, which means he actually bears our loads. And it says he, he loads us up. It's the, it's the one that means it's like an imagery of your loading like the donkey who is the beast of burden. And you're loading up on him heavy loads that which he is loading up on us benefits that he carries in our lives for our, for our benefactor collaborative process. That's insane. So he has like, in other words, it, it's almost like it sits in a maze. It's almost like we're born to a multi-billion dollar grandfather, in this case, father in heaven, who gives us, he gives us spiritual wealth beyond compare. And he's following us through life. He's loaded to bear, just waiting to pounce on us more benefits. And like, that, that's, that, that's crazy. We don't think of it that way. But yet that's what happens. And then I always tell people that the analogy I give is if you, if you did get a knock at your door and a billionaire, uh, an old lawyer said, oh, by a billionaire named John Doe, uh, he knew you or she knew you or they knew you, whatever, and they left you countless of billions of dollars a lifetime you can't spend it in. And you're going, I, I don't know those people. Who are those people again? And you say the name, John Doe, John Susie Q. You're like, I don't understand. Who, who, how, how do they know me? Well, I, 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 listen, all I can tell you is I was told to come to your door and give you this paper that has access to all these funds. However, they said you can have some interest, but the principle, you can't have any of it unless you read these, these memoirs that they wrote about themselves. You don't have to read them, but if you do, you'll learn more about why that is, how they knew you, and about them. How many would spend time reading those memoirs? <laughs> I would. <laughs> I'd want to read those, right? But you still get the interest. How many wouldn't read the memoirs because they feel like interest is good enough to live on? This is why people that want to know Christ and live on his grace of forgiveness and his blood and his mercy and his love, they're good with that. That's the interest. They don't want to know the principle. They don't want to know the, the point of his character and the details of his word. They could care less. The interest is enough for them. They don't want the principle. They don't want the basis of why God loves them or who he is and what he really says. They're satisfied with the interest. I'm not because I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm floored by the fact, why would a multi-spiritual billionaire choose me? It doesn't make any sense because I know I, I suck in a lot of ways. Why would you why would, why would God love me? I don't get it. I just don't get it. But yet, that's why I want to know him. That's why. Not because I'm not satisfied with just him giving me Jesus and, and his blood. I'm thankful, grateful forever. 
But I'm, when I say satisfied, I mean I'm not like just resting on that as all I need. I'm thankful for that deeply, but I know that from that, that wasn't all that was meant to be because once you get that empowerment from God to believe that, you can't tell me you love me just had that one time belief and that was it. There's more to it, right? There's gotta be. There's more to it. That's like having a child say to the mom and dad, all you wanted to do was just birth me, right? And that was it. No, I'm not going to leave you to the wolves. The whole part about how you have a child to raise them, to teach them, to right, to instruct them, to love them, right? To invest in them. And so here, so here in verse 19, he says, Blessed be the Lord who daily, who daily loads us up with benefits, even the God of our salvation. In other words, he loads up, he's talking about the salvation that we have. Is one, in other words, he backed up the truck of his blessings when we first realized our salvation, in this case, of covenant, to know he was the one God there is out of the ignorance that we didn't have. So we had a creator who created, who loved us. We were ignorant to who he was. He loaded up the truck, if you will, of his benefits. It's, a, it's just a phrasing analogy. He has truckloads of benefits to give us, even in the initial salvation experience. So here's a God who is Baruch, who's kneeling down to give us blessings, who's waiting, he's loaded for bear, Every day, it says, to do to daily, every day. That, that's the crazy part, too. Not only is he loaded up with benefits, but every day he's doing that. Now, a lot of folks are stuck on the, on the loaded up benefits of love, forgiveness, mercy, peace. And that's wonderful stuff, and it is. But how much more would you appreciate that if you knew who was giving it to you? The more you understand the person who's giving you those lo that love and mercy and peace and compassion, wouldn't that transcend how you experience that? If you don't believe that's true, think about it. Can a person who's a friend of yours give you love and, love and mercy and peace and compassion, and it mean the same if it was your mom and dad? Don't lie to me. It's not the same. The person who renders those same things changes how you experience it. So how much, because the reason why is the relationship defines how you experience those things. So the relationship you have with God should be redefined by the depth you know of him. So don't just be satisfied with what he gives you. Know the why behind it. Know the person behind it. And he's saying that every day he is doing that, loaded with benefits to give us. And what has he given us? Oh, I don't know. Just the depth of who he is and his word. Wow. Wow. And, and he says he's doing that every single day to different people across the, the plane that he has not just created, but has made aware who he is as creator, second tier of love and who ongoingly are obeying him, because that's, that's what's writing about here, and David's talking about how God is protecting him from his enemies, and he's talking about how God is daily watching after him, who's been anointed. So let's go to the next psalm. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> the next psalm, 103. <coughs> Turn to Psalm 103. Psalm 103, in verse 2. This is that song you hear. I've heard Maranatha singers sing a song. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. So it says, bless the Lord, bless Cave, O my soul. Psalm 103, verse 2. Bless, again, the, the kneel down, Baruch, the kneeling down to one to render one's blessing. And then when it's using, uh, verse 4, he says, he says, blessed is the Lord. Now he's saying for us to bless the Lord. So now, we're, now when we, the blessing is used about us giving it unto him, that it is in a sense of not him kneeling down to us to bestow upon us, it's us giving back him like a tribute to a king. It's our gratitude, it's our thankfulness. So when we say, bless the Lord, people say, oh, bless the Lord. When you say that, you, you, what, you're, what you're supposed to be understanding in your mind and heart and spirit is, you're rendering, you're, submittive, you're submitting your will to the fact that God is sovereign in your life and you're grateful for it. So when you say, bless the Lord, or God bless everyone. What you're saying is, God has his sovereign will, how he pleases, when he pleases, however he pleases, and let us be the, the receiver of the happiness behind whatever that ends up being. That's what that means. So you, when you say bless the Lord, he's talking about kneeling, one, rendering your will, and bless God, and kneel down and give him homage to what is due. Oh, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. The word benefits here is the word gemul, which means his recompenses, his rewards, that he is a just God who gives back according to each one, to their merits, to their deeds, as he says it, right? So you do have this relevance here about how we are to be thankful and grateful about how God is blessing us and forgetting not what he's given us. Turn to Psalm 103 again, verse 10. Look at verse 10. He hath not dealt with us after our sins. Thank God for that, right? nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Well, that's pretty, uh, 
pretty pr pretty poignant. So he doesn't deal with it. That's pretty crazy right there. So let's read that again. He has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our transgressions, or our iniquities, excuse me. After our sins or according to our iniquities. So whether it's our sins of missing the mark or whether it's our perversions of God's word, he doesn't retribute us for those things. So that's a problem that I have in my own heart because there's often times every day, throughout a day, when I'll do something wrong later on that day or that week or that whatever, is I may say, oh, but I'm paying a price now. That may be a consequence, but that's not God like kind of punch me down. That's not what's happening. But in your mind, you think that. I mean, I do anyways. Even though it's a consequence that I have that I have opened up the reality to come into my life because God tells you and me, Remember the Mount Gerizim and Ebal principle. If we do good, he'll bless us. You do bad, there's cursings that'll come upon us. So he's not directly doing that. He's just saying, look, you've opened up a consequential reality that's going to be happening now. So it's just the rules and laws of how you obey or disobey what's going to happen to you. But it's not him directly trying to pick on you. That's not what's happening. It's not him directly saying, let's come to task on this, son, daughter. You did this wrong. I'm going to bring you to bear on this. That's not what's happening. And he tells you in verse 10, God has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. How fantastic is that? Because if he did, I wouldn't be alive standing here right now today. I, I wouldn't be, and neither would you, by the way, right? We'd all be dead, for the wages of sin is death. Why, do you ever think about that, by the way? The proof of this, people say, that's not true. I can give you testimony, testimony of how God made my life a living hell because of my choices I've made about how I abused people and how I did things wrong and I hurt people. And I made bad choices, and I heard God. And, and I would say to them, but you're still alive, right? They go, yeah. Well, then God didn't deal with you according to your sin, to your iniquity. What do you mean? The wages of sin is death. You should have been dead, I don't know, say, as soon as you were born. As soon as you were conceived, you should have been dead. Because the wages of sin is death. Since you are a sinner, why didn't you just die right there? Why does he allow us at all to live till 50, 60, 70? What, why? What's the purpose? He, he's telling you right here. Because he doesn't hold it over your head every day. Remember 1 Corinthians 13, we read at weddings, love is patient, love is kind, love holds no record of wrong. That is awesome. So if he did hold record of wrong, he'd say, oh, there's a litany of sins, take them out. Wages of sin is death, take that baby out. Whoa, he doesn't do that, does he? Now, sometimes babies do die in the womb and die out of the womb and so forth, right? But not all of us, all of us should be dead as soon as we're conceived, because we're sinners. Wages of sin is death, why wait? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, there is. Yeah, I'll get that in this. Let me say this. Yes, babe. Uh, lady said, just the consequences of the sin is experienced. Then we blame God for punishing us later on. Yep, and that's what. And that's. And then David's reminding us, don't do that. It's not him. He's not doing that. That's. That's our consequences of our sin, making us feel that God is making us pay a price when it's God's rules that we violated, and those rules have consequences. And now we're having the consequences of violating the rules take their effect s indirectly, sub subsequently. So it's not him. It's like the teacher saying, hey, uh, you don't pass the test. You're going to you're gonna, you're gonna get a, a failing grade. D you failed me, teacher. N no, I didn't. I, I, I submitted your grade, which caused you to fail, but it's you the one who didn't do the homework. It's not my fault. It's the same thing. So God's going, don't blame me because you didn't do what you're supposed to do. The test has consequences and rewards. But, it's, but as the teacher, what he's saying is, in that, in, that, in that analogy, the teacher, he's always willing to tutor you, always willing to embrace you, always willing to not hold against you that you were lazy and ignorant and disruptive in class. That, 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 that's crazy. He's not ever going to bring that up to me on a daily basis, ever like uh, hold it over my head. He'll bring it up to me, but he's like hold it over my head every day. Are you kidding me right now? I would if I'm a disruptive, rebellious, ignorant, disobedient, unwilling, unteachable student. I would definitely bring me to task. But God's saying, hey, I'll, I'll let the consequences take care of itself. But as far as I'm concerned, I'm not going to deal with you after your sin or I'm not going to reward you according to your iniquity. Now it goes to your question, Nancy's question. The iniquity, remember, can be subconscious or conscious. But it starts internally. It's, it's, a, it's an unknowing or knowing conscious decision that you're changing God's word to pervert it to match up to what you believe is right. Free will is, an, it, no offense to people who believe in free will, 
but it's a, it's, a, it's a clear indication that person has iniquity within them because they're refusing to believe that God is sovereign in the scripture and in their lives. So what they do, I'm not trying to be offensive to people, I'm just being honest. So if you believe in that, then you are basically saying that you reject God's character for who he is. And so because of that, you're then twisting it to make it sound like, no, you're embracing his character. That's the definition of iniquity. You're perverting, you're twisting things to fit your mindset of how you can therefore then outwardly make a statement and have a doctrinal thesis that states, what's wrong with that? There's a lot wrong with that because you're, you're, you're making a belief system into niceties of all these things that come out of it that is on the premise of destroying the character of who God is. And there was never a point in scripture where dirt ever called out to God and said, pick me when you put your hand on the ground. Use me to form the first man. Please, me, me, me. That, that's not recorded anywhere, so stop lying when you say that. There's never a baby anywhere ever recorded in mankind after that fact when there was clay made to animate human beings. There wasn't human beings who then had procreation, who had a baby inside them, ever say, oh, I want that, I want to have that kind of soul. I don't ever remember that happening. There's no human being who can ever say to me, I remember in the womb when the sperm and egg caught together and I was being forged. I remember my body's being forged. I said, God, let me see, like I was in a, I was in a closet of a wardrobe of a, of a Victorian queen castle. And I went, yeah, I want, uh, I want that soul. I, I don't remember that ever happening. So if you can prove that to me, then again, there's free will involved. All these things are not hard to understand, but people don't want to believe it because it, re it rejects the fact that God is in control of your life. And no one, no one, including me, who believes in sovereignty, likes to acknowledge the fact that every day I'm a subservient slave to the will of God. No one wants to admit that. Because what that, that tentacles of that means is that everything, good and bad, is the way it is by God's will. And you can't change a hell of beans. And people don't like that. When loved ones die, when you yourself get cancer, when something else bad happens, you're going, God ordained that? Yeah, they, no, I can't believe that. Th there's your evidence that you have a problem with sovereignty. You only want to receive it when good things happen. Or when the bad things happen, you can make good out of it. But the bad you can't rationalize, you can't make good out of it, that's why you, you go blah, 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 so you go to free will. You can't rationalize. Where does it say in scripture, you have to understand it and therefore that makes it true? Where does it say that? It doesn't say that. God's truth does not require your understanding. God's truth does not require you to acknowledge it. It, it doesn't require that. It just is. So, so iniquity is internal, but, ex but it's expressed externally by a matching up of the internal perversion that externally you then want to match, they match up with each other. So yes, yeah, sorry babe, online, apologize. Mm -hmm. So, so this is where you're supposed to be thankful and grateful for, for God. So now let's go to Psalm 107, verse 43. 107, verse 43. This is a great verse. This, that's now, now I talk about some general verses about being grateful and thankful, and I'm bringing in some depth of scriptures to what the words mean and what that means to us and the sovereign God. Now he's getting in specific to people he has called to walk in a mature way. Psalm 107, verse 43. Whoever, whoso is wise. Now, that's specific to people who have, partake, who have partaken in an, in an obligation and a privilege that he has endowed your spirit, your mind, to be opened up to his truth. You did not will it. You did not one day wake up and deserve it. You didn't earn it. Let's make that clear. None of us ever on the face of humanity have ever earned the right to say to God, I am wise. Don't even go there. That is, a, that, is a, that is a hellaciously bad thing to ever say or think. God makes you wise or he doesn't. It's just that simple. You don't make yourself that way. That is moronic to even think that. It is foolishness. So he says, who so is wise? In other words, those who he has made wise and maturing in spirit. In other words, a way to say that. And will observe, and will observe these things. Even they shall, it says, understand. It means to discern. To discern. Understanding is putting thoughts together in, the, in, a, in a coherent whole. Discernment is taking that coherent whole of understanding and, then, and, and seeing where it does and does not show up, does or does not apply, and the intricacies of seeing what's not being said to understand how what's, what's not being said fits into the framework of what you understand in those details. So discernment is transcend understanding. There's understanding that you have to have before you have discernment. You have to have knowledge, then understanding, then discernment, and then from there you get wisdom. So it's knowledge, under, there's knowledge, understanding, 
discernment, and then there's wisdom. And you're going to sit here and, 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 and look at these, the, this verse ref referring to specifically only people who are walking with God, who are called to be mature, are given wisdom by God, and then they, he says to them, and will observe. Now you have a decision with that wisdom. Will you use it, Solomon, appropriately and discern appropriately the things of God? Or will you use it for your own personal gain, Solomon? <laughs> right? What are you going to use it for? So he says, will you observe these things? Even they, sh he says, observe, you know, guard these things. And by the way, observe means to military guard. That, that, that's that word for mil military guard. In other words, you have to take, so he says to you and me, the wisdom that he's given to us, who are given the, the privilege of walking maturely with him, it's a privilege. I didn't earn it. You didn't earn it. If you don't know that, then something's wrong. I didn't do my job, and God certainly didn't maybe con convey to you co correctly, because I'm, I'm sure he did, but we just didn't get the message. So the reality is, he's made us wise. And if he made us wise, and he, if you understand that, he's saying, you should take some serious, serious, serious precautions to protect yourself from not losing that, that truth. What do you mean by that? Don't, don't frivolously subject your mind and your, and your precious gems that God gave you to just, you know, as he says, to swine around you. Don't, don't do that. Don't, don't, spend your don't spend the majority of your time and, or spend time that should not be deemed wisely differently. You should be spending more time with the Lord, more time with investing in things that, that are honoring to God. You shouldn't be taking that wisdom God gives you and not guarding it closely. Because as much, as much as it's precious and can be, it can be um, given to you and stacked up upon, it can easily be un unfortunately spoiled, just like that manna. You have to daily be watching this. Is that they will understand or discern the loving kindness of the Lord. And again, so he says, we're, we're, to, we're to guard watchfully, we're to discern. And the word loving kindness is the shekhad, which is the, it, were, it, it says the love of the Lord in some translations, but it, it's the loving kindness, and it says mercy. So not just his love, it's his loving kindness. The sheket is a word that reuses the word love and kindness conjunctively, which is why the King James says loving kindness actually pretty appropriately. So it means loving kindness as if to say God's inner disposition and God's actions in love that are expressed with kindness because sometimes God's actions in love aren't received by us in kindness. You know. Like when a mother in love gives medicine to her child, do they receive it as kindness at the time? No. When a, when, a, when a father in love spanks a child for putting his hand on the stove or in the socket when it's wet after they got out of the pool, is, that, is it received as kindness? No. But, he, but they're doing those things in love. So loving kindness means an inner disposition with an outward action of love that's received by the receiver as kind as well. That's pretty awesome. So he says to you in verse 43 of Psalm 107, Whosoever is wise, whosoever God has given the wisdom to be mature, we should have a military guard. We should take very, very seriously this military watchful diligentness that we would discern, see the why behind the what, understanding the how, the loving kindness. Understand what discern what? His loving kindness. When God does have that disposition, when God does do those actions, and we do receive it as kind, do we understand when, we when God acts that way to us, can you pinpoint why that is? Because he's saying that you should. He's saying you should be able to know when God's acting lovingly kind to you, when you receive that in your life, you should know exactly why. I can testify that that's pretty true. You, you know that, by the way. You do, at a mature level, you do know that. You know you do. There's moments where you'll get an overwhelmingly sense of God. God's always loving and kind to us. Don't get me wrong. But there's those moments where you have this ridiculously shakad, this overly loving, kind gesture from God that you receive it as kindness. It's an act of love based on an inner disposition, and you can clearly know why. That's what he's talking about in Psalm 107. Now let's go to Psalm uh, 116, verse 12. 116. 116, verse 12. What should I, re, I, re, I render or return unto the Lord, unto Kaveh, for all his benefits to me? And the word here, benefits, is not the same thing as mentioned before in Psalm 103 when it was his rewards and recompense. Now it's the word, not gimel, but tagmo, which basically means all his many, many blessings, his many benefits. 
So in verse 12 again of Psalm 116, what shall I render unto Yahweh for all his many blessings and benefits to me? And now I don't know if you've gotten the theme so far that I'm picking out verses that should be really ingrained in our mind and soul and heart and spirit that make us go, how could you not be thankful and grateful? How? How, how could you not be? We just, we're not even, we're halfway almost there through the, these, these verses. How could you not be grateful and thankful knowing what you know about who, not just knowing who God is, knowing what you know about who God is, and knowing what you know about how God is continually, daily, lovingly kind to you and me. It, it's insane. It's insane. And so you go also now look into not just Psalm 116, 12, look at Psalm 118, verse 1. Oh, give thanks. Extend your hands, right? Unto the Lord, for he is good. Unto Kaveh, he is good. Because his mercy endures forever. It says here to give thanks, and that means to cast your praise, which is why they, the exegesis says, extend your hands, because you're ca it says cast your praise. In other words, you're, the word casting is that, that verbiage that you has your hand fully extended to cast outwardly. So it isn't just like waving your hands in charismatic churches. It's, it's casting. So one could cast like this. You could cast like that. But it means an extended hand. So it means you're praising God. So I mean, you're extending your hand. It gives you like you're reaching out to, to say thanks. So an extend, people, we use that phrasing, uh, extend a hand to somebody in need, right? So when you're extending your, when you're doing praise to God, it's a raise of saying you're extending your hand back to God. It brings back to that earlier analogy I gave of the artist Michelangelo's. What's it called? Uh, is it called David? What's it called? That God and man, whatever the one with man's touching out for the finger. Is that just called God and man or something like that? Adam, so it's called Adam, yeah, Sistine Chapel. But when he showed, it, it kind of reminds me of this, this Psalm 118, verse 1. Oh, give thanks to God. So that, that painting, whether, whether Angelo meant it or not, is a depiction of what it means to give praise to God. You extend your hand to touch back to a God that gave you everything. <laughs> Who's everything to you, right? Then he says, for God is good. That word good is tum, T-O-W-B, which means God is beautiful not just good but beautiful glowingly wonderful wow so then you go over now as you go to one more old testament uh go to lamentations chapter three lamentations chapter three and verse 22 Lamentations 3 and verse 22. And he says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his, compa his compassions, his tender mercies fail not. <laughs> it's of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. The Lord's mercies, by the way, is that same word again, his shekhed his inner disposition that outwardly manifests itself in love and we receive it with kindness. We receive it as kindness. It's because of that disposition, of that action in which we receive in kindness. It's because of that, oh man, the Lord's shakad, his loving kindness, we are not consumed. The word consumed means that we are uh, basically what you mean, to, have to come to an end. In other words, that God doesn't just kill us. Yeah. Fire. Fire. But yeah, God's a consuming fire, and He's a he, He's a jealous God. I mean, the whole thing is that to be He He says because His inner disposition, His inner disposition of love, to act in love, for you to receive it in kindness, is causing Him not to end your life. That's pretty dramatic. That's like my goodness. So you're saying if it wasn't for that, you would? Well, yeah. That's the opposite of that statement, right? So if it wasn't for His compassions, we'd be consumed. We would have our life utterly brought to justice on behalf. So he tells you earlier that he, he does not hold a judge us according to our sins and our perversities, our iniquities. But now we know why. It's because of his internal disposition to want to act in love and have you receive it in kindness. Then he goes on in, in verse 22 to say, because his compassions, his compassions, right, that's his mercy, his, his ongoing, long-suffering mercy, fails not. Now when that word fails not means it means to kalah. 
And the word kala means it never ends. Never ends. That brings a whole new, to me, gravity to that words, the words fail not. Fail not means you're so, it kind of brings up to the, to, to the might and power of God. I, I fail not, I'm always gonna be victorious. But when you say kala never ends, well that's different. That means no matter what state that I believe or think or feel, this particular thing that he's saying to me, who he is, will never stop being that person of who he is. So, you mean, wait, 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 wait. So in tribulation period, when he's unleashing hell on earth, literally, with damnation and wrath, his compassions fail not. Are you stop? what? So even in the midst of the most horrifically, you mean fire brimstones running down on Tom and Gamora, he was still having tender mercies. What? His character, he's all, you cannot separate the wrath of God from that inner disposition that he says never ends. It never stops. So even when you hear, if I'm before the beam of seat of God, of Christ, and say I'm going to Gehenna, I'm going to be a rebellious soul, and you can put me in Gehenna, he's still internally, even though he's judging me with a harsh sentence, he still has tender mercies because they never end. That's, that, that, I, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what that looks like. How can you receive bad news from a loving, tender disposition of someone who's rendering you bad news? And I remember, I remember there's a, a book that Chuck Swindoll once wrote about leadership, and he called it giving tough news in a soft way. He called it a velvet brick. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so and tough news, it hits you, it's a hard truth that hits you softly and how it's delivered. So it made me think, well, that's the best way you can explain it, but that's more to it than that. When you're receiving a harsh reality of pain and a harsh reality of consequence and a harsh reality of, of, of some strain in our relationship between me and God because of my disobedience and all along. With, but within there, I know there's tender mercies that never end. I, I don't know how to explain that. I don't know how to even fathom that. I don't know. The best I can ever remember is I remember when, I, when, when, when Ryan was two years old. We had him in, in Chattanooga one time. I've told you the story long up there. I had him in Chattanooga, and he disobeyed, and, and he was doing some bad things. And I took him back in the back room, and, and then I remember Nancy was crying, like, don't, don't, like, don't do it. I was, like, really mad. So I went back there, and then I spanked him, like, like pretty hard. Like, I, it was abusive. No, I spanked him, so I wanted him to cry. And I wanted his butt to be red. So I did it on purpose. But not, like, abusive, like, just to spank him where his butt was red, and he would cry. So he did. But I said, we're not leaving this room until you because he said to me, I don't love you, I don't like you, I hate you. Like, you know, they, they all say that, right? So, okay, that hurts, right? But I was trying to be calm. The whole time, there's no inside, I'm going, this sucks, man. And so then I said, we're not leaving until we sing a song and you laugh. And I said to him, I want you to know that God's pain in your life that sometimes happens when we're disobedient is also not separated from his love and care and joy for you. And I want you to always know that. He's like two years old, two, two and a half. And so, so there was crying, and, he <laughs> and then all of a sudden he starts singing, Jesus loves this, I know, the B-I-B-L-E, and all this kind of stuff. And then all of a sudden they start tickle fighting, and we just laughing, and I carry him out, and he's hugging on me and kissing on me, and then she's like, what just happened in that room? That was weird. So he went from tears to, ele to laughing to, to like just hugging on me. And so I remember that was the moment, I guess for me, I don't know what came over me that made me say that, but it reminded me of what I never had as a child from my parents, like ever. And if I did, things would be differently in how I would understand things now. But I believe that's how God is right here. That's the best I can understand Lamentations 3.22. That's the best I get as a glimpse to what he might mean by that. I'm going to have some painful, like, like seeing his face angry at me, like I was with Ryan, but also seeing a face that wasn't anger intrinsically. It was just anger at the action, not the person. And he has this, in, to the person, this intrinsic love that runs so deep, I can't help but to smile back. And then that's kind of what, that, that's what happened in that, in that room that day, many years ago. Yes? Uh, first of all, Vicki said, this must be the verse that the hymn, Great Is Thy Faithfulness, was penned from. Oh, yeah. Todd said, I thought the same thing in that group. Oh, it, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Great is thy faithfulness. Absolutely. Great is thy faithfulness. Absolutely. And then you know, now you know when he says his compassions fail not, he's talking about his internal disposition of his loving mercies, his, ten, his tender kindness, his loving tender kindness mercies, that that disposition never ends. There's never a time where he goes, okay, I'm gonna set this aside now. I'm gonna be wrathful. <laughs> That's not what happens. No, no. So, and by the way, who's writing Lamentations? Jeremiah, well, who's inspiring him? Well, of course, it's God. But what did God ordain for Jeremiah 
to experience. A life of discord, a life of ostracization, a life of being alone, a life of rejection, a life of hatred and malice, indifference. Oh, and did I mention all that by the people who are supposed to love him? Not his enemies, his own family, his own kinfolk of covenant. What? And he, he, not, not, not David, not Abraham, not Moses, not the apostles, not Job. He was given those words to write. Come on, man. This guy experienced constant rejection and never somebody hearing what God would say through him as to be true. And he writes that? You know, he understood what it meant because he lived it. He, he lived it. The having eyes to see not and having ears hear not. We had a whole bunch of people. No. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, see not, hear not, and yet, and, and he just, I mean, I can't imagine when he wrote this, he I, I'm sure he was weeping when he wrote this, going, oh, oh, how this is so true, how this is so true. And probably, I mean, thinking about the times in the well, broken legs, they threw him in there. Yes? I think he said, morning by morning, your mercies I see. Yep. And, and it's just, and it, it's amazing, again, so we're talking about being grateful and thankful, and this one verse here, as we end our Old Testament journey through these verses, it reminds us that Again, go back to my earlier statement, the more you know about the character of God and the person of God and the word of God, the deeper the statements of truth become. And if you don't believe that, when you get to heaven, have a talk with Jeremiah about what this verse meant. I guarantee you Steve Green's singing of the song or, or anybody else's rendering of the hymn book song has nothing compared to what Jeremiah understood when he wrote the verse. I guarantee you for a fact. I can guarantee you. I can guarantee you for a fact that if you understood from sermons and books and, and seminars when somebody says, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed is his name, have a conversation with Job when you get to heaven. And once you ask him and his wife how that really, what that really means, they'll understand. They'll give you a transcendent understanding that will knock you and blow you away. Like, what? And they will just give you a, a, a depth of experience because with wisdom, is bit stacked up upon knowledge, understanding, discernment. Then you have that wisdom. And the wisdom to write these verses is because you've lived it. You've experienced it. It's a huge difference. And so that's why being grateful and thankful isn't just a grateful and thankful for who God is and his love, but you can, it, it, you, you can do that. It's all legitimate. But do you want just a surface level of thankfulness and, for, and gratefulness to God? Or do you want to have some pillars like that tree talks about in Psalm 1? Do you want it to have deep-rooted gratefulness? Do you want deep-rooted thankfulness? What do you want? I want the deep-rooted gratefulness and thankfulness. I want that. That's what he's saying. That's what Jeremiah, how do, you, how do you write that and not have that, given what he experienced and what he's writing? It's amazing. Just amazing. Now, let's go over to the New Testament and just a couple of verses there. So let's go to the New Testament as I'm rounding out this, this lesson for today. I mentioned a little shorter time today. Ouch, my arm hurts from holding that. I actually got a muscle cramp on my arm now, holding my Bible. Well, that, that's a first. That's because I'm putting out decorations. My arm hurts. Ah, got a cramp in my forearm. Ah, all right, so in Ephesians 5.20. Ephesians 5.20. Dying a lot now. Ephesians 5.20. Giving thanks at all times on account, Ephesians 5.20, giving thanks at all times on account of all things to the God and Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes? Todd had said, I blame the Christmas lights. <laughs> yeah, no, no doubt, man. <laughs> I was out there all day yesterday. <laughs> so giving thanks at all times on account of all things. That's um, pretty poignant, don't you think? Giving thanks <coughs> always for everything. So if somebody goes, you're telling me you give thanks to God and you fill in the blank for this horrific thing that happened in your life. Yes. You can't be serious, man. I was raised in a broken home too, an abusive life. I don't give thanks at all for that. <laughs> Ephesians 5.20. Maybe you didn't hear God. Give thanks at all times on account of all things. Did, did, he, did he say only when things happen to you that are good? Did he say give thanks at all times for things that make you feel wonderful inside and give you warm fuzzies? That's not what he said. 
No, I, 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 mis I, mis I misread it. I, I, I'm sorry. Give thanks at all times on account of those people that love you. No. Let me see. Did it say that in your translation? No. And always, for everything and always, give thanks. So always and everything. Goodness gracious. He left nothing out. <laughs> he left nothing out. So you can't like, you can't say, oh, the time when I stubbed my toe, oh, the time when I, that, that thing fell on and it, and it cut off my finger, oh, the time when my, that person actually ripped my heart out and they betrayed me, oh, that time when that one person let me down, that one person just abused me, that one person trafficked me, that one person exploited me. Y yes, 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 yes. That, that sounds heretical. I, giving thanks on, on, at all times on account of all things to the God and Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, giving thanks to God our Father in the name. Why is that important? Because what did he tell you? Remember, go back, go over to Peter. Remember, go to 1 Peter again. Why does he say giving thanks to God? But he says in the name. Why in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Just giving authority to Jesus? Eh, kind of. But why else is that important? Why, why else would he, would he say in the name? Well, we know why. We studied it before. Let's remind ourselves, going back to 1 Peter in chapter 4, in verse 11. If anyone speaks, let it be as the oracles of God. 1 Peter 4, 11. If anyone serves, let it be as from the strength which God supplies. Choreagios. God choreographs. So that in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. And that's why he says, give thanks in all things at all times in the name of God the Father, I mean, to God the Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. You know why? Because God is orchestrating all things to bring out the glory of Christ in your life. That's why. You go, what? Yeah, 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 yeah. So the exploitation, abusive, painful, traumatic experiences that you and I went through in your life, I'm not going to sit here and compare ledgers. We all know what's true and what's not true. I'm not, whatever, right? So whatever that is in your life is what it is. You can't change it. But you can change how you perceive it, and you can change how you interact with it because your pers your perspective of it. The perspective is, do you reject that God choreographed that in your life, or do you receive it? If you receive that in your life, that God choreographed that, they, so why would God do that? that that's sacrilege! Shh! No. No. He did it so that through those things, through those things, Jesus Christ is glorified through your life. So start trying to figure out how through all those calamities and traumas and pains is Jesus glorified in your life. Yes, you are. How? You better start figuring that out. Because if you're not figuring that out, how the Hades can you give thanks in all things at all times to the God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Unless you acknowledge that you have to have understanding that God's orchestrated all those things to glorify Christ in your life. It's that simple. Go now to Philippians chapter, <coughs> chapter 4, <coughs> verse 19. Philippians 4, 19. Just three more verses, and then we're done for today. Actually, a shorter message today of being grateful and thankful. Philippians 4, 19. And my God, we know this verse because Mr. Tim Tebow made it popular. Interesting how when he bent on one knee, they, they cried foul because he wanted to give thanks to God. But they bend on one knee now to protest against the flag. They got no problem with that. Isn't that a, isn't that a hypocr hypocritical statement, huh? You know, one one is in, deemed inappropriate. The other one is lauded as awesome. <laughs> pathetic, just pathetic. Philippians four nineteen, and my God will fully supply, will fully supply, which means fill you completely. Great translation. All your need, all your need, your, your kriya, your kriya, this is all your need. That's what goes back to the book of Acts. They each one gave according to each one's need that they had. According to his glorious wealth by Christ Jesus. So God will fully supply. Remember who Philippians is written to. It's the only epistle that Paul was orchestrated to write that he had nothing against them. He did call them sincere ones. He did call them people that he wants to thank God for every memory of them. So they, they, were, they were obviously interdisposition-wise, from an agathos standpoint, 
God's Agathos goodness in their hearts was as good as it could be in the maturity walk they were on. And to those people, he ends by saying, and may God fully supply all that you need according to his glorious wealth. What's he saying? He's giving them the idea that the glorious wealth of Christ, which is the knowledge of who he is and the knowledge of what he has said to you, may that be what's fully able to in help you endure, help you be strengthened and emboldened to get through the traumas and the sadnesses and depressions and the heartaches, the persecution from the Roman emperors, the ostracization from your families, when things don't turn out right and financially you're strapped, when things happen where, because back in Roman days, by the way, if you know this or not, when you did bankruptcy, you know what they did, by the way, in Roman law, look this up. They actually, you did bankruptcy back in Roman law because financially you were, stra you were strapped and you owed a debt, they would take the dead bones of your loved ones and dig them up and put them before your door. That's pretty gross. And it was a way of disgracing your family because to them, you crossed the line without fulfilling your commitment. And so they had a right to disgrace your family. Whoa. So if you were, so that was, people say, financial is not a big deal. People say, if, if, your, money, if your problems can be solved by money, then you're, you don't have problems. You have opportunities to learn. Well, okay, that's a nice platitude. But back in the, it's not, I'm not saying that's not true. But back in the Roman days, it wasn't funny. Financial problems led to families being dishonored. Families being disinterned and being just treated with no respect of the dead. And then you were in turn left with these bones in your front of your, 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 your front of your doorstep. What do you do with that? It's, it's just like, it's just so demoralizing. You're paying twice for your sins now. You're bearing the weight yourself. Now you feel that your ramifications have affected your family members, that, that their, their memory is now being soiled with this, this action? Ugh. Yes. <coughs> Yep, it's reversed sometimes. It's a good question. It's reversed sometimes because of what you're thinking. Yeshua is the name he's, he was given as a, as a man. Christ is the Mashiach, his prophetic, who he is, his position. So who he is positionally is Mashiach. He's the Christ. He's the anointed one. Yeshua is referencing his, his name given as the salvation of Israel, the man, the son of man. So when he is focusing on Yeshua, Jesus Christ, he's focusing on the son of man who's the Messiah, who is the anointed one. The other way is reversed. So what's he bringing up first is God's sovereignty. When the Christ is first, it's always the sovereignty. Always. That's being focused in on. Why? Because the Christ is the anointedness, the anointed Messiah who would come in a prophetic time unto God. He was always, he's always son of man. He's always, but the Messiah is a manifestation of God fulfilling his prophetic truth in time. So Yeshua always exists. But he didn't exist as the Messiah always until he came and was born. And that speaks to a sovereign moment in time that he became the Messiah. He acted that he became flesh. He was always Yeshua, always. <laughs> but he wasn't always Christ. He wasn't always the Messiah until he became, he fulfilled that prophecy when he came in the womb of Mary. When he fulfilled that prophecy, boom, that he, he became a man. He became the Messiah, the God in man, God in flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. So when it speaks to Christ Jesus, it's emphasizing God's sovereignty, that his ordained will in your life will come to pass. So that's why he says, what a coincidence in this passage in Philippians 4, 419, he's speaking of God's sovereignty, saying he'll provide all that you need fully according to the wealth of Christ Jesus. In other words, not the wealth of financial means, the wealth of the spiritual maturity, the wealth of who he is and what his word says. May that be enough, may that be enough to guide you through and, and, and anchor you to what should bring you peace and joy in your life. Doesn't mean it always will. Doesn't mean it always will at the time. But letting your emotions get out of you, letting your mind with the confusion get out of you, let, let that all acknowledge that. But then go back to your anchor. Go back to the anchor of who he is and what he has given you. That wealth of who he is and what he's given you, that will anchor you. That's what he's saying. He's not saying it would keep you, remember, when a boat's anchored at, at sea, when the hurricane comes, does it just sit there like this? No, it just, it gets moved around. <laughs> it just doesn't get moved out of its location as much or at all. But the reality is the stronger the anchor, the more you stay in your location, right? We have the best anchor there is. So you're going to move. <laughs> you're going to have your emotions betray you and your thoughts betray you. That's natural. 
But when all when all the, when the storm assuages, rec recognize where your anchor is. It should be in the wealth of who he is and what his word has given to you. And may that give you peace. May that give you joy. May that give you love and acceptance in your heart. Yes? And that if when Jesus is presented first, it's focused on his salvation as the lamb? Correct. That is correct. It's focused on his salvation. It's focused on him being the son of man who came as a sacrifice for us. That's correct. It's focused on his humility, his sacrifice, his salvation. Absolutely. So Christ is the sovereignty part of God, and then the Yeshua, Jesus, is the, is the salvation, provisional sacrifice part of God. So he's, talk, he's talking about what God did in, in God the Son. So if you go to James, by the way, <coughs> James chapter 1, James chapter 1, we know this verse. James chapter 1, verse 17, every good gift, every good gift, every agathos gift, and every perfect gift, every mature gift, is from above, coming from the Father of lights. So every gift you have in your, so understand what that means. Be thankful and grateful, because a lot of people who read this that are in Christ have no idea what he's talking about. They got zero idea. Because they go, every good gift, I have a nice house and a car and a wife that loves me and a husband that loves me and I got kids that are wonderful and parents love me and I, nah, 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 nah. That's all great stuff, by the way. It's not what he's talking about here. He said every Agathos gift. Yes? Um, I think he asked what verse that was to tell us to give James 1.17. James 1.17. So when he says every Agathos gift, he means those are nice, by the way. Those are nice. I don't know all that. Wonderful. However, however, you're, you're, you're sensationalizing and, and short shortchanging what God's really talking about here. He's talking about the depth of the disposition from which those gifts are exchanged. Because if I could do a secret Santa, if I do a gift exchange, I do I can, I can do gift exchange, secret Santa all day long. But what if you were blind and Jesus gave you the gift of sight? Does that gift outweigh the gift of paying your debt off, buying you a new house, giving you a new dress, giving you new shoes, a new suit? Uh, yeah, it kind of does. Because I can't I can't measure that. <laughs> it's unbelievable, right? When he says agathos gift, he means the inner disposition. The inner disposition, we say it this way, remember, especially at Christmas time coming up, we always say, it's not the gift, it's the thought that counts, right? It's the thought that counts. And so the thought behind this, for James 1.17 is, every agathos gift is from God. In other words, whenever you or someone you know exchanges with you an act of God's love to you, or you exchange God's love with someone else, that came from God. Every time an internal disposition of God's love, sacrificial love, his selfless love, not just the love of human to human, we all have that kind of lower tier love. The sacrificial, scripturally based, grace and truth love of God, filled with grace, his loving, tender mercies, but also backed up by his truth of the depth of why they're doing it, the inner disposition of a person who is loving on you or is giving a gift unto you, that comes from God. So every time you experience agathos from somebody or you experience that from God in your life through you to someone else, that's from him. He's telling you that you don't, there's nobody who does that on their own. There's nobody who backs into that who figures that out. Then he says every, every, he says every perfect gift, not just every agathos, but every perfect, every mature gift. So every gift Everything you've been given, from inner disposition, from God to experience something that has some depth to it is because God gave you that grant from to either through you or from someone else. But everything you hear about and understand about the scripture that rises you to a level of more maturity of knowing who God is and his word, that's from God. You say, oh, surely that came from that book of that guy, that author or that preacher guy or me. Nope, I didn't do nothing. The guy who wrote that book or gal who said that thing didn't do nothing. It was God. God said, every time you learn from somebody or something or some book or some whatever, and it deepens your understanding of who he is and his word, that came from him. Every time. He's saying every time. There's nobody you can ever say, oh, I, but I say that sometimes myself, but I don't mean to say it that way. I say, well, I learned a lot. We learned a lot going to Chattanooga and learning from Calvary Bible Church, and it makes it sound like, you know, they were the ones. Not really. God used them. God did that. God used different people. 
It's always God, God, God. He's saying he's the one behind making you wise. He's the one behind making you mature. He's the one behind opening your eyes and opening your heart and opening your, your spirit and growing you in, in his will. He, he's behind all that. Don't lose sight of that. He's telling you that comes from him who's the father. He didn't say father of love. He says father of lights. Isn't that interesting, by the way? As if to remind you, you are a darkened soul. You're a darkened soul, and don't you forget it. Genesis 1, the Spirit hovered over the face of the deep. And then God said what? Let there be light. And that we love darkness and apprehended not the light. So he's ma making sure he's again putting a sovereignty statement. When he says Father of light, he's speaking of his sovereignty, which is why I love Christmas lights at Christmas. That's why I love Hanukkah. It speaks to his sovereignty, that with him being the light, it's emphasizing we are a darkened, dark, dark, dark soul people who love dark, dark darkness. We don't know light if it hit us in the face. He made us aware what light was. That's how we know what light is, because he told us. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't know. I still love darkness. Scripture says so. Yes, sorry. Steve <coughs> said I have a note uh, that the perfect gift is only for called out ones. That's right. Valid. Yep, that's right. The perfect gift is, is mature. For, it's, tele, it's teleos. It's for called out ones only. You're talking about people that are, again, are of the sperma seed only. That's why I'm saying most people in Christ would not understand this verse. James 1.17 is dealing with being thankful and grateful, but specifically for how and who is making you wise, for how and who is maturing you in your faith. It's God. And he's doing it through agathos disposition created within you and used by others who he is in their lives exp expressing that to you. Every time you feel that or you give that, it's because of him. Every time you, you actually experience that or give that, it's him. Every time you grow in spirit or in maturity in your mind, that's because of him. It's all because of him. And he's reminding you, and who does he call himself? The father of, again, of, of love? No. The father of truth? No. Father of, all those are true. But he said father of lights. To, again, emphasize that you are a sinful, darkened soul. You have no chance of willing yourself to know this stuff. He made it aware to us. Yes. Agathos gift. An agathos gift would be defined as a gift given from an inner disposition that mirrors the character of God selflessly, sacrificially, with pure motive. Which means you can't do it. You, you, only God can do that to you or through you. That's it. So the Agathos gift is the inner disposition, sacrificially, selflessly, with pure motive, that can only be given to you or through you by God. That's it. He said okay. Remember God said, why do you call me good? There's none. Why do you call me Agathos? There's no Agathos but God. In other words, you're making it sound like I'm one of many good. Are you guys crazy? There's, there's nobody here who's Agathos but me. No one has an addition of their heart that's selfless, sacrificial, and pure motive. Only I have that. Who, who else, who, who, who are you thinking of when you say good teacher, as if I'm one of many? Are you crazy right now? There's only one. <laughs> it's like, wow, okay. <laughs> so, and lastly, go back to Philippians. We're going to end with this for today. Go back to Philippians chapter 4, <coughs> verses 6 and 7. I wanted to end with this verse today because this goes through my mind he says be we, we th we've already studied this this book remember we studied all these books we studied James Ephesians Philippians so your notes don't surprise me because I know I got them too right <laughs> so we we have already studied these books right but not we didn't pick out verses from the Old Testament and New Testament to parlay into a topical study of being thankful and grateful and the reason why because of who God has called us to be we definitely are the called out ones, right? So Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. Be not anxious. Be not anxious about anything. But in everything, let your petitions be made known to God by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. <laughs> with thanksgiving. So in other words, do not let your worries and your concerns 
overwhelm you. But in everything, let your petitions, in other words, pray and ask to God, have, let your, you better just pray to have your conversations with him be made known. If you're thinking it, you may as well say it. If you're thinking it and it's weighing down in your mind, say it to your Father. Make it known by prayer. That's your conversation with God. Let your petition, in other words, what you're at, whatever you're specifically thinking about, you better have a conversation with God about it. And your supplication means you better ask specifically what you're talking about. So if you have something that's weighing on your mind, your petition, talk to God about it, prayer. And supplication, get specific. Tell him what you need, because that's what the word desis means. Desis is that word for supplication. It means to express your need. Tell him what you need. He's your father. He loves you. Talk, talk to him. But do it with thanksgiving, he says. I love this, this second part. If that part's not good enough, because it's awesome. And that peace, <laughs> I love the word for peace, the word e-rine, E-I-R-E-N-E, e-rine. E and the peace of God, or the peace of God, the, the, the peace of the God that surpasses all conception, all reasoning, all thought, all intellect. What's the peace of God? The wholeness, like making you a whole person. It, it, it has that idea, that wholeness of things that are joined together. So now you see how all things work together, how God has choreographed your, because you have a thought, you didn't let it weigh on you, you took it to God, you had a conversation with him, then from that conversation, you expressed your desis, your supplication, your need, and you did it with thanksgiving. You're grateful and thankful for the situation you're in. And with that, he says, and by doing it that way, and from that, that disposition, the God of the peace will surpass. He will go above, beyond, and superior, beyond anything you could ever think of, understand, reason. And then he says, and you shall guard your hearts and your minds by Christ Jesus. You shall guard. In other words, there's that phrase again, your military guard. Take it very diligently and seriously how you guard your heart and your mind, your paradigm, your perspective, your worldview, your mindset. Be careful who's influencing that in your life because it's hard enough to live through life in a sinful being status that we are in a sinful world. We're sinful beings in a sinful world, and it's hard enough to have that which weighs on our minds and hearts not cause us to be anxious. Don't make it worse by leaving down the guard. In other words, there's already a lot of enemies that want to attack the castle of your mind, of your spirit. Put your watchman on the wall. Don't be ignorant. Put your watchman on the wall. Guard yourself. What and how? What should he say? He says your mind and your heart. What affects you emotionally? What affects you mentally? You gotta, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm preaching in the choir here. You gotta protect yourself, but be thankful and grateful, he says, that we have the opportunity to have a God that says, what's weighing heavy on your mind? Let's have a conversation. So you have, you have a petition or a request? Let's have a prayer, let's talk about it. What's supplication? What do you need, son, daughter, what do you need? Wow, man, we have a God that says that's okay. That's okay, he's there all the time to say that to us. But I, for one, don't take advantage of that as much as I should. And so he's saying, no wonder why. You know why? When you, when you don't what you do, when you don't do that, he's saying you don't have God's peace with you. The wholeness of who God is is not in your life, keeping you whole at peace, which is evidenced by the fact you're letting your mind and the reverse is true. You've let down the watchman off the castle of your spirit. Your, your spirit and mind and soul is in this castle. You should have watchmen on, on the walls looking out for enemies trying to attack you. And they should not let that happen to you. And protect your paradigm. Protect your perspective of yourself and who God is. Yes. Mm -hmm. I run to the Savior with thanksgiving in my heart. Yeah. Blessed verse 7. I mean, you, know, yeah. you, you won't have verse 7 if you're not going to say it. It's true. Enter his gates with thanksgiving in your heart. Right. You, have to, you can't enter. That's a good point. You can't enter his gates unless you're thankful. And enter his courts with praise. So, it's be, so you could say you can't even enter unless you're thankful. And you can't inherit unless you've been a life worthy of praising. And when you pray, as we saw before, it means to extend one's hands. And to extend one's hands means you're s submitting yourself to a sovereign God, giving back thanks for everything he's orchestrated in your life. So that's pretty crazy what he's talking about in, in Philippians. He gives you like a, an answer 
all these answers we got in Old Testament, and this, why we should be thankful, why should we, why should we, why should we be, 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 be grateful. But then he gets into Philippians 4, 6, and 7, and he gives us the summation of it all, in my opinion, of just saying, hey, you know what? When things weigh heavy on you, let's have a, let's have, let's have a talk. As we, as we say that, that song, now let us have a little talk with Jesus, <laughs> right? Tell him all about our sorrows. So you, you, we sing those songs, but do we actually do that? You know, and that's the whole thing is that and it's not just singing the songs and doing that. It's how do we do that at a deeper level they've already saw before in Psalm 107. He says those who are wise understand. We guard ourselves, right? He's telling us over in, in James that he gives us the maturity of a, as a gift to us. It's we of all people. We of all people. We of all, I can't say it enough. We of all people. If something weighs heavy on your mind, we got to go and have a conversation with our God. So the petition requests, hey, everything's heavy in our mind, we go to talk with God as a prayer. And in that prayer, make your supplication known, your desis. Tell him what you need. Lord, I can't do this because I, I, I just, get to the, don't get to the symptom. Get to the problem of the whole part of the matter. It's destroying me. It's, it's paralyzing me. It's causing me to have cloudy judgment. It's causing me to have you know, indecision over here. It's causing me to have frustrations over here. It's causing me to make bad choices here. It's causing me to compromise my love over here. Whatever it is, just say it. Say, I need you to help me with those things. And then, when you say it, you can't just say it in frustration. You have to say it in the back of your mind knowing you're thankful that God's ordained all the things that contributed to that state. Can you do that? You have to say what you need in the context of knowing the need was created by the choreographing of God in your life. And can you do that with a thankful heart? Because if you don't, you can't enter his, his gates, as Nancy was just saying. And the kind of Lord's presence is bringing in yeah. everything. And that was in Ephesians 5.20, right before that, where the verse was about singing psalms and spiritual hymns to him. And the only way you can do that, the following verse said, to give thanks in all things at all times. So you have to, singing is because you're, you've acknowledged God's sovereign, you have, what's that? Psalm 100. Psalm 100, yeah. You, you've recognized God's sovereignty in, in your life. And so I hope that that has been some helpful journey of being thankful and grateful this time of the year. That was just, a, I'm going to write these verses on the board on when I'm done here. But I wanted to make sure I just took a, a brief uh, rabbit trail down the thankful and grateful sense of how we should be this time of the season. I know we came out of Thanksgiving um, going into the studies of Elijah and Elisha, but I wanted to take a time to do this transitional message before we start our Christmas messages and Hanukkah message starting the next few weeks. Yes. And the fellowship of his suffering. We might want the fellowship to be something else, but it's the fellowship of his suffering. So remember, the fellowship of his suffering is, is because you're attacked because of what he's given you. So because he's the one who's given us the good, their, their fellowship of suffering is because you got an agathos gift from God. Because you got a teleos gift from God, people are going to make you suffer because they're jealous, because they're angry, because they're frustrated, because they're confused. Why come I don't have that? Why, why are you better than me? I think you're wrong. You're a cult. You're odd. You're weird. Because they can't accept the fact that God expresses his love differently. They can't accept that. So when they don't accept that, they reject the sovereignty of God. They, re they reject the character of God. And then from that, you who are receiving the character of God and receiving the different loves of God, they reject you and therefore you suffer in the same fellowship that he suffered with because it did the same thing to him. They rejected, when Christ spoke about the character of God, they rejected it. When he spoke about how God determines what he, who he wants to give what, remember he said, there's many widows in the times of, 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 of Elijah. There's many lepers in the times of, of Elisha. There's only one that I chose. They're like, yeah, why is that? That's my question to you. What makes you think you're any different? I'll do, who I, I'll do what I want when I want. And they didn't understand that. So they made him suffer because in his, their minds, he didn't match up to the character of God and to the word of God that they were espousing. That's the fellowship of the sufferings. It's because people hate you and despise you because of what God has made himself aware to you and what he's shown you in his word. You know who he is and what he says at a level that they don't understand. And because of that, they cause you consternation and, and they constantly badger you. There's no such thing as, as this. Or there's that. That's much malarkey about this bride of Christ stuff. And that's, that's garbage about waves of a rapture. Hey, you keep saying what you want to say. I, I know what's true, but you can make me all day long suffer because of who God's made me. And that doesn't, I mean, it's not my fault. God made me this way. 
God made me to understand what I understand about him and, and his word. I didn't one day wake up and go, well, how can I understand things that are so different that I'll be hated and, and ostracized? I didn't wake up and do that one day. No differently than I woke up one day and go, oh, you know what? This whole Jesus thing is kind of cool. I'll look into it. That's not what happened. If you say that to me, you're lying. There's nobody you can ever hear. I don't care who you are. If you hear my voice across the entire planet, if anybody ever says to me, there was one day they woke up and go, hmm, I'm going to go look into that whole Jesus thing. Th there's no way that happened. Th this, this, that's not, that's not, and if you're saying it did happen, I have a conversation with you, and I will help you understand that that's not the initial time you first had that conversation with yourself. You probably already heard about Jesus, and then you said that. But there's no way without hearing nothing at all, you one day woke up and said, hmm, I'm, look, I'm looking into this whole Jesus dude. That, that's not what happened. So that, that's not how it works. God works on you for a while, and then, you make, and then he makes a change in you. God always works on you. It's what he always does. He did, remember he says in Philippians, he is continuing to work in you. He's, he's going to continue to work to fulfill his work in you. It's not going to stop. So anyway, so we're going to stop there. And as a little short of time, like I mentioned, a little shorter lessons for today. And we'll end in prayer. So, Father, thank you for this time we've had today. Thank you for the opportunity to, to learn, to grow, to understand, to be thankful and grateful uh, for you. Help us to have hearts that are just ingrained in knowing that you orchestrate all these things to help us to understand not just who you are and what you've said to us, but specifically for what you've given to us, helping us to be wise, helping us to guard and keep watch over our hearts and minds, our, our, the, the castle of our soul and our spirit, to keep the the watchful eye out, the things that want to penetrate and, and change our paradigm, our understanding, our perspective of who you are, that you're everything to us, and that who you've been telling us about yourself more and more and through your word and how the word means so much to us because of what we learn more about that draws us back to learning more about you and just continues that ebb and flow of constant growing and understanding so that when we do meet you face to face one day, it won't be a surprise and shock and awe over the fact that we had an idea, at least, of the glorious majesty and honor and praiseworthiness of who you are. We're always going to be in awe of you, Father. But help us to be closer in understanding, closer in, under, in just the relevance of knowing that who you are and what you've stated to us in your word will give us more prepared, give us a better opportunity to experience you in, in truth and love and, and peace. We thank you for this opportunity we have during the holiday season to be reminded of, again, your things of praise that you do in our lives, you orchestrate, that we are thankful and grateful for all things at all times. Keep us mindful now in the season coming up ahead we have when we celebrate the time of light and the time of darkness, the time you shed brought your love in our darkened, sinful hearts. Pray for us, Father, now. We, we, all of us, we ask you to be our Father of watching over each and one of our hearts. Guide and direct us. Keep us close and throughout the week. Bring us back together safely in Jesus, Yeshua's name. Amen. Yeah, it says here, the glory in our infirmities and the yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, very true. What? 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 what you could have picking the wrong side. You kept clicking the wrong side. Oh.